Since the beginning of human cognition, people have looked up at the night sky and wondered at the frontiers of our knowledge. While there are examples of solitary human explorations, most endeavors that push boundaries involve teams of people working together for a common goal. Our SIGGRAPH 2016 keynote presenter has been at the center of many such collaborative efforts. Today, we will gain insight into the story behind the missions that make great discoveries achievable. It's my great honor to introduce Z. Nagin Cox. Nagin is a NASA JPL operations engineer. Her leadership across multiple NASA JPL interplanetary robotic missions, such as the Galileo mission to Jupiter, the Kepler Exoplanet Hunter, and the Mars Curiosity Rover exhibit a body of work full of challenges and exciting possibilities. Her significant accomplishments um, have been recognized and awarded. She received uh, the NASA Exceptional Service Medal and two NASA Exceptional Achievement Medals for her work on the Mars Exploration Rover team and Galileo mission. She has also received the Bruce Murray Award for Exceptional Public Outreach. Nagin even has an asteroid named after her. Please join me in welcoming Nagin Cox. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Not that I can see you, but good afternoon, everybody. I am very honored to be here today. Thank you to SIGGRAPH for the invitation. And it is truly a, uh, a remarkable opportunity for me to get to talk to people where uh, we, our industries are so closely connected. What we do in the space program, we can't do without you. And I have had uh, the opportunity on other occasions when I spoke at Blizzard and had a great time with them and for Spark and Visual Effects Summit to really have a chance to talk about uh, what we do together. So what I'd like to do is start with a video. And this is a video from landing day uh, when the Mars rover Curiosity landed on Mars on August 5th of 2012. And what you'll see is what was it, what it was like in the, in the mission control room. But I also want you to consider that everything that you're seeing was happening remotely on Mars. And so even our ability to show a video like this is not possible without what you do, without the animators, the artists, the visual effects, all of that helps us convey what we do. So we learn about other worlds. We use machines and computers to help us uh, explain and explore other worlds. And what you do is, of course, help us see our own world uh, in a different way. So it's a real honor to be here to tell some of these stories. So let's start with the video and see if you see yourself in the fact that we could even put something like this together. So let's start with the video, please. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle has just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. It is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Universal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. The parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. The chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers descending. 
standing by for batch off separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so that was an incredibly memorable night, one that uh, I will never forget. And it's probably not what you think about, right, when you think about robotic space missions. So today I'll take a little bit of time to talk about some background and what you see when you think about those robotic missions. I put this slide up here so I remind myself to say just a couple of words uh, about my background. I have a, a bachelor's in, in operations research and industrial engineering from Cornell University, and I also have a degree in psychology. Honestly, sometimes I'm not sure which one I use more. And uh, I also have a master's degree in space operations. So after I got out of uh, left Cornell, I went and spent six years in the Air Force serving my country, and it was amazing. And I have kind of have a one-track mind, so I was in space operations there as well. Uh, but then afterwards, I arrived at JPL. Yay, I've wanted to work at JPL since I was 14 and have been at JPL now, as you can see from that list of missions, for about 20 years. Not quite sure how that happened, uh, but when you work on multiple missions and they're about four years or so, and certainly time flies when you're having fun. So when most people think of the space program, they tend to think of the human side. They think of the space shuttle, the astronauts, and the International Space Station. And yet, that is just a part of what we do. So NASA's mission is to explore our planet, to understand our planet, to determine whether there was life anywhere else, and also to extend human presence beyond the Earth. So NASA is actually set up like multiple space agencies throughout the world, where we all have centers that are located in different parts of the country, like the Japanese Space Agency and uh, ESA are set up the same way, that all have different areas of expertise. So of course, as you know, we launch our vehicles from the Kennedy Space Center in Texas, and our astronauts live, uh, sorry, in uh, Florida, and our astronauts live and train at the Johnson Space Center in Texas. But today we're going to talk about the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, right here in Pasadena. So this is a picture of JPL, only there's a giant fire going on right now, so the sky doesn't look like that uh, at the moment. It actually looks more like Mars. And, uh, but there are about 5,000 people that work there, and we're the size of Disneyland. Uh, so let me see if I can ask this question, even though I can't see everybody. So how many of you watch The Big Bang Theory? 
right? Okay, so see, I could, Eve, I could see all the, uh, the hands going up. So I ask that question all over the world, and I'm consistently amazed. I ask that in a remote area of Pakistan, and you wouldn't believe the amount of hands that went up. So there are people all over the world that watch this show. So the reason I bring it up is because the show, for those of you who don't watch it, is a, a television series about scientists and engineers who work at the California Institute of Technology. So I work at the California Institute of Technology, and I just want to say, we're not that bad. Right, right, we all know, we're all nerds to a certain extent, right, but we're not quite that bad. Uh, and Caltech actually runs JPL for NASA. So we are a laboratory that belongs to the California Institute of Technology, but Caltech runs us for NASA. And it's actually remarkable to have a television series like that that shows science and engineering as something that is so prevalent around the world. So in the 1930s, JPL actually did jet propulsion. We started out as an army facility and we were doing jet propulsion. But then when NASA was formed in 1958, we got a new charter. And that was the robotic exploration of the solar system and beyond. So before we send people, we send robots. And I think that's why I wanted to work at JPL from such a young age, is if you really want to go where no one has gone before, then that would be the robots and uh, the precursors to human exploration. And we've now explored robotically every planet in the solar system including Pluto, because we are an inclusive space program and we still think of Pluto as a planet. And so this is a remarkable image that we got. Yes, we like, we remember Pluto, that we uh, got of Pluto last year when we first flew by. So for much of the time, uh, for all of the time that, that many of us were growing up, Pluto was simply a fuzzy point of light that we didn't know very much about. And then last year, after a journey of nine years, New Horizons arrived, and now Pluto is a real place and a real world. The ability to convey that is something that we rely on the computer graphics industry to help us show, whether it's Juno that went into orbit around Jupiter uh, July 4th, just a couple of weeks ago, or the early days of planetary exploration when luminaries like uh, James Blinn were the ones who were pioneering this field and the ability to, to show the general public something like the Jupiter and Saturn flybys. And many of us saw those animations. I, for one, saw much of this on Cosmos and were inspired to come continue that exploration. So a little bit of background on the missions. No matter what planet uh, we're visiting, we will do so when the, when the planets align. So for example, we'll talk more about Mars today. So Mars and the Earth are at their closest point together about every 26 months. So that's the launch window when we can get to Mars and have the data rates be better, the flight time be less. So like good neighbors, we try to go every opportunity that we can and Mars exploration is one of the focus of the robotic program. So when this started in the 1960s, it was primarily an endeavor by the United States. But now these robotic missions, they're all international in scope. And now we have countries like Japan and India. India just sent an orbiter and the United Arab Emirates is talking about sending a Mars orbiter. All of these missions are collaborations. Like when, uh, when the Mars mission la uh, launched from India, we sent, JPL had an instrument aboard. So it's extremely typical that we work on these missions together. There are scientists from all over the world that participate in these joint missions of exploration. So what we're trying to do robotically is find out could there have been life anywhere else in the solar system? And the first step of that is follow the water, right? That's the mantra, is follow the water, whether it's extrasolar planet uh, hunting or, uh, uh, or if it's in our own solar system, we're looking for water. Now, when I first got to JPL, again, about 20 years ago, the conversations in the hallways were literally, do we think there's water? Might there be water someplace else? 
and we really didn't know. But in the space of my professional career, I've seen that change. And now we know that there is water elsewhere in the solar system, and now and in the past. And we've moved into the question of what makes a planet habitable? What makes someplace habitable? And can we find, can we go to the next step and find the beginnings of an environment for life? So in order to do that, we have to get up close and personal with a planet. And in this case, we'll talk about landing on Mars, like what you saw in the video. So the first stages of planetary exploration are to send a spacecraft that does a flyby, like our flyby of Pluto, that's phase one. And phase two is to send a spacecraft into orbit, so you're there for a period of time, like we did with Juno that went into orbit uh, at, uh, on July 4th around Jupiter. But phase three is, is to bring either a piece back, so you somehow get in situ. You either bring a piece back or you land, like we've done with the Mars rovers. And once you've landed, we first landed on Mars in 1976 with the Viking missions. But once you've landed, you also want to start ranging around. You want to start roving. And so we had to learn how to send rovers uh, to other planets. This is Mars Pathfinder, uh, which we landed in 1997, our first rover, not much taller than my knee, and didn't go much further than the front part of this auditorium. Mars Pathfinder was recently brought back into the public consciousness in the movie The Martian, and it certainly was our first learning process of how to drive on another planet. And since then, we have landed the uh, uh, other rovers, the 2004 rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, that was my first rover mission, and their objective was to find out, was there ever liquid water on Mars at the surface in the past? So that's in the past, but we're, we were looking for liquid water that had existed on the surface. And both of those rovers landed on different parts of Mars, and the answer to that question was yes. There was, in fact, once water on Mars in the past. But to answer that question, we couldn't send people yet, so we had to send a robotic geologist. And so these geologists are, are these robotic geologists are our eyes and ears. And that image, that data coming back, is all what we had to interpret through the tools of your field, of the computer graphics, of scientific visualization. All of that is possible, and uh, from uh, that we have to translate the data into something that the scientists and the engineers could use. So the rovers were supposed to last for 90 days, for three months on Mars, uh, but I'm happy to report that Spirit landed, uh, lasted for six years, and Opportunity is still functioning on Mars 12 years later. So y'all are, oh, thank you, thank you. We are very proud of that ourselves. So y'all are definitely getting your money's worth from opportunity. Uh, and so at the moment, we have two active rovers on Mars. And so Mars Curiosity is the rover that I'm working on now. So once we knew that there was once liquid water on Mars in the past, then the next question became, okay, how long was it there? Was it there long enough to have created an environment for life? And in about 2000, we started to think, the engineers started to think, oh gosh, if the rovers, if Spirit and Opportunity are successful, now the scientists are gonna wanna send something even bigger. So Curiosity is about the size of a small SUV, which immediately created for the engineers the issue of how do you get something so large to Mars? and we had never landed a payload this large. So that's what you were seeing in the video. And even though we had these, uh, so we made a video of the method that we were going to try to land on Mars, and we called it the seven minutes of terror, right? And it went viral, uh, you know, by NASA standards, it went viral. And almost everybody sent us back, the comments were all, so that's not gonna work, right? And so we started out, we would come in to the Martian atmosphere at about 12,000 miles per hour and then fire a parachute supersonically. And this is what you saw in the video. And, uh, and of course, these are obviously uh, stills of an animation. And then we use this jet pack 
to fly the rover down to the surface, lower it on a rope, a very strong rope, at the same time as we're firing the thrusters to slow down once we touched the surface, then we would cut the bridle and the descent stage would fly away. So the first time we said we showed this, the chief of the uh, entry, descent, and landing team showed this to NASA headquarters, the head of NASA said, uh, no, you're not going to do that with taxpayer money. I don't think so, right? Because it looked so crazy and so unlikely. And yet you've all probably had the same experience when you're you know, pitching a new storyline or a new way, a new pipeline or a new way of doing something where the people around you say that cannot be done. And the chief engineer now has a book out on this called The Right Kind of Crazy because we finally convinced NASA headquarters that one, we had to do this because otherwise we wouldn't be able to land large payloads on Mars, which we need to do to eventually send people. And so we had to take this risk. And so the, the then head of NASA said, I still think it's crazy, but maybe it's the right kind of crazy. And so these were the first pieces of what ended up being a very long process of trying to determine how to do this on, uh, how to land something this large on the surface of Mars. I don't have time to go into all the other challenges that we faced as we were trying to build this exceptionally large rover to send with all these new capabilities that we would be landing on Mars. And this was the first time, you know, that we have this giant robotic arm with a drill at the end. So we're going, we're going to be drilling on Mars. And unlike Armageddon, the movie Armageddon, we don't have Bruce Willis to help us figure out how to do that. So we were actually busy, even as we were flying to Mars, learning how we were going to drill. But we finally got the rover ready, named her Curiosity, and launched on the day after Thanksgiving in 2011, because we always do things near holidays. So right after Thanksgiving, we then flew for seven to nine months, again, a beautiful artist rendition of uh, the flight from the Earth to Mars, which can take seven to nine months. And so sometimes if you hear the uh, scientists tell you the story about heading for Mars, they will, or flying, they'll say, and seven months later, right? Like nothing happened in those seven months, but the engineers are very busy uh, with the, course tra the trajectory course corrections and something that you guys might be familiar with as well is we actually learned on the Galileo mission that you don't have to have the surface software, the flight software done for the surface mission when you land, when you launch. You just have to have it done when you land. <laughs> so we are usually still busy writing code when we're flying to Mars. And that's because you can't, you never have enough time to do it as well as you'd like to or to, to work through all of the failure modes, all of the test cases. So we use that time flying to Mars to keep, to train ourselves for entry, descent, and landing, and to finish the code, which we upload right before we get there. <laughs> so we're landing at Gale Crater and Mount Sharp, and this is an area, so this is a crater on Mars uh, where there, it's large enough that there's actually a mountain the size of Mount Everest in the center. So you can imagine why this is a very high priority landing site for the scientists, because landing there is like uh, landing on the Grand Canyon. If we can traverse our way up this mountain, then you can see much of the history of Mars in one place. And now these entire conversations about where we're going to land take place over the course of many years, and we're using, again, uh, data from the orbiters and visualizations to try to help the landing site selection committee know what those areas are like and where we should land. So that brings us to landing night. Oh, that's right. I have a little box. There's me. Um, on and, and so this is us the night before. We're all wearing these like, we look like we're from Best Buy right? We're all wearing the same shirts. And uh, for those of you who've seen The Martian, one of the things in the movie is about how the other NASA centers are a little bit more formal than us, right? And so they, you know, we made an attempt to be a little more formal and all wear the same color shirts. 
And uh, uh, it was, so, you know, we had these entire conversations before we landed about how we were going to stay in our seats and be very professional, right? And obviously with the stress of wondering whether this was going to work. So everything that was happening was happening on Mars autonomously. And uh, we were, so the one-way light time to Mars can be anywhere from five to 20 minutes, approximately five to 20 minutes. And on landing day, it was about 10 minutes. So everything that we're seeing happened on Mars 10 minutes in the past. So there's nothing we can do. So we're literally watching the data on our screens. And instead of staying in our seats, you know, this is what happened. Touchdown confirmed, we are safe on Mars. Words that we had been waiting to hear. Some of the people on this mission had been working for a decade on this. And I've been asked repeatedly, what was it like to be in that room? And I'll tell you, I think, you know, I think somewhere over here in the front, there were uh, IMAX cameras. And, and none of us, it wouldn't have made any difference whether there were cameras there or not. Not. What you're seeing is a group of people that had worked together to do something that we didn't know if it would work and seeing it ha finally happen. We had landed on Mars, the first time I was in this room was in 2004. We had landed on Mars successfully, but this time that was kind of a prerequisite, right? Assuming you're landing and your, your mission hasn't even started. None of the things that we were looking to do would even have a chance to get started if we didn't land successfully. And so then when these images came down, you probably heard Brian say, thumbnails, we have thumbnails, right? And so those initial compressed images told us that not only was the rover on Mars, but she was healthy enough to send back pictures. I didn't think I'd feel the same way I did in 2004, but it did not feel like a robotic mission. It felt like we were there, like we were seeing Mars through our own eyes, through the eyes of the rover that we had built. And, and this is our flight director, the one who told us all to stand in, stay in our seats. He was the one who was jumping up and down uh, in the video. So when you've landed a big international mission on Mars, the president calls, and so this is President Obama, and of course all my bosses show up when the president calls. So this is uh, uh, President Obama, calling us from Air Force One and saying, thank you for not crashing it, which we heartily agreed with as well. So the first images started to come down from Mars and it never looks like you think it's going to look, right? This, this was amazing. I still remember when this one came down. But at the beginning, we're all just like anybody else, right? What's the first thing you do when you go to a new place? you take a selfie, <laughs> right? So we have a robotic arm. At the end of the robotic arm is a camera. Hi, mom, right? So we send out a selfie and then look at our feet to make sure that we landed okay and then begin this amazing exploration. So we have quite a payload with us uh, from all over the country. And so we have uh, Sam and Kemen. These are our chemistry lab that we're taking with us. So again, if we were now going to find out, was the water there long enough to create an environment for life, then we actually had to bring what's the equivalent of an x-ray machine and an oven with us. Again, our robotic arm with a drill at the end, a laser, not a death ray, a laser science instrument that lets us see what the rocks are like from a distance. And again, many of these instruments are uh, from other countries. Let's see, Dan is Russian, Rems is Spanish, uh, APXS is Canadian, ChemCam is French. So scientists from all over the world. And this payload is not just supposed to find out what was the environment like on Mars in the past, but we're also measuring radiation. Very important for being able to send humans to Mars is obviously understanding the radiation environment. So now working on Mars, the minute we start talking about this, again, it's everything, uh, it, it, it simply does not happen without the tools from your industry. So we start by sending our data back from Mars, usually through orbiters, 
that you see here that are in orbit around Mars will send them up through our UHF antenna, and then the orbiters, which have much more power, will blast the data home to the deep space network. And the deep space network is one, there are other uh, networks around the world, but it's one series of antennas in Australia, Spain, and um, California, where we receive the data, and then from there, it will come to the different centers that might be involved in the mission, in this case, uh, JPL. So this is the fourth floor of the building that I work on, where we first receive, and again, you might recognize some of the equipment and images that we're seeing, so where we first look at how did the, uh, how did the rover perform on the prior day? on the prior Sol, a Sol is a Martian day. And so we will uh, look and see, did she drive properly, if she was drilling, how did that all go? And then we'll get a assessment that, okay, everything went well on Mars, and we will, and then we can proceed into planning. So when I'm uh, doing a, when I'm on shift for Curiosity, uh, as I was on Friday, this is what uh, the team that, uh, that, that I'm in charge of is the uplink and downlink team. And so the next step is, okay, now that we know that the prior day on Mars executed as we expected, let's start planning for the next day. Now this is what mission control looked like in the uplink area, planning for the next Sol in the first 90 days of the mission. Because in the uh, early part of the mission, all of the scientists and engineers are together. So these are literally scientists, uh, let's see, I think these are the Spaniards, the Russians are over here, and they're all with us. And that's what we can learn to work as a team. Now those scientists and their engineers are, all, are remote. So we are all, they've gone back to their home institutions, their home countries, and now we're all working virtually. And so again, here we're using, you know, all of the technology that will allow us to collaborate, but initially we are not so, unlike, we are actually not remote, we're not joysticking the rover. Right, the, because the, again, the one-way light time to Mars, the Chinese landed a rover on the moon, uh, let's see, December or so of 2014. Now, they are able to basically joystick their rover because the moon is about three light seconds away. Now, I realize by your standards, that's, pro that's still not, you know, that's too much. Uh, but by our standards, that's really close, right? The moon is a hop, skip, and a jump away. And so they are able to pretty much remote, uh, remote uh, control it. We have to remote sequence the rover. So that means we will plan, like right now, the rover... Uh, at the time that we're planning, the rover's usually asleep. So we work the Martian night shift. So while the rover's asleep, we will plan what she's going to do the next day. And initially, this process took us 16 hours. But now we've gotten much better at it. We've been on Mars for four Earth years, and uh, we can do it now in about eight hours. And so, or eight and a half at the moment. So we will figure out what we want her to do the next day, and then, and we'll use the data from the prior Sol to figure out, uh, and then the scientists will decide, do we want to drive, do we want to drill, what do we want to do? the next day. And uh, again, so they'll say, okay, we're going to continue to make progress towards Mount Sharp, because uh, one of the things we have had to do is we had to land in an area that was more flat and then drive over to Mount Sharp sampling as we went. So are we going to drill? Are we going to drive? Those are some of the decisions that the scientists will make. So one of the very obvious applications of computer graphics and visualization is when we are planning our drives. Our our rover planners will look at data from Mars, usually a stereo anaglyph that they'll put on 3D glasses for, and they'll say, okay, if this is the terrain that we want to try to traverse, how are we going to do that? Are we going to let the rover do it itself? Are we going to uh, do a blind drive and say, trust us, we know what the terrain is like? So we start with all the data from the cameras that we have, and especially our front has cameras. So we will use those our hazard avoidance cameras. Um, and so we'll use that along with data that we have from the orbiters. Now, again, remember that to you guys, I mean, we're behind the industry. We're behind your industry because we are using 
information uh, in a different way, and also what we have on board are, are uh, uh, the computers that we have on board are radiation hardened, et cetera, so they're almost always a generation behind what you would be using. So we will use data as a starting point from the orbiters. There's an incredible camera uh, on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter called High Rise that gives us very high resolution data that we can use to get a sense of what might be in front of us. And then the rover planners will use that information, again, to decide for themselves what path shall we take, what kind of mesh do we have, and are we able, how far can we drive based on the information that we have. And so the rover will use the cameras and take a, you know, make a stereo map of what's in front of her. And then if we decide to have her drive herself, then she can do autonomous navigation and drive around some of the, the uh, obstacles. Often, I mean, as you could expect, we have to close the loop around those maps on board. And so the processing time is significant. So it will take us a lot longer to do a drive if we're going to let the rover do that. So it's the real world constraints, uh, it's the real world constraints that decide are we going to, you know, are we going to let, are we going to let the rover drive? Do we have enough time? Uh, because our days on Mars can be short given our power constraints. So in the end, she might say, okay, I will drive this way. And some days the terrain, you know, again, we're not driving as far. Those are some of the near, the daily applications of how we look at the data, visualize it, the si and when, when this is happening, there are people literally, so we'll start out our day, and we will, the images will come in at the beginning of the, the end of the Mars day, the beginning of the Earth day, uh, that we're starting our planning. And we'll look at these images, we'll see where we got, we begin to see how much data do we get, what kind of mesh do we have, and the decision about how we're going to drive is made very quickly at the beginning of the day based on the data that we have. But a lot of the, the scientists are not looking at the same workstations that the rover planners are, so they may be using snapshots. They may, they may be using pictures. So one of the things that, that you can see in the VR village is a scenario, which is a, 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 JPL, uh, a, a JPL VR tool that allows us to take that 2D imagery that uh, is being seen and make it available to the scientists who are literally around the world who are helping plan the drive. So we're not trying to do that based on 2D images or at best, 3D that we might be looking at with uh, stereo, with, uh, with uh, 3D glasses. So we've been on Mars for four years. I'll put just a, a brief note in here about uh, our original objective. So we went to Mars to find out, was the water there long enough to have created an environment for life? And the answer is yes. If you had been standing on Mars, where we were, you actually would have been standing in a rushing river about three billion years ago. And you actually could have drunk the water. The water on Mars was drinkable in the past, which of course creates a whole set of conversation about where, where did that water go? You know, what happened to it? And of course, at a different level, it also reminds us that planets can be very different from what they once were. And since we are busy conducting an uncontrolled experiment in climate change on our own planet, it's probably good for us to remember that and be aware that planets can change. And so we find what we're learning about Mars isn't just relevant to you know, planet formation and is there life elsewhere, but also in helping us remember to be good stewards of our own planet. This is where we are now. This is a spectacular picture, so I had to show it. And uh, so we're right now kind of off to the side and we'll eventually be coming up approximately up through here. So these, these, this journey, the, this is a road trip, right? Everybody gets a car in a road trip. But being able to figure out where we're going to go and being able to convey that to the public relies on the tools that both of our industries create. So as we move forward into what is standard for you guys and we start uh, incorporating augmented reality and virtual reality and VR into our tools, we hope to do something more like this where it's uh, more collaborative and we can all 
ourselves and make our decision making more accurate and faster. Now let me see if I have this next. Oh, I want to show you guys this picture. So this is BB-8 visiting JPL, right? So we're near Hollywood, so their robots visit our robots. And so here's BB-8 talking to uh, Curiosity, right? Visiting other autonomous vehicles that we have. Here's BB-8 with her visit visitor badge, right? So the reason I show that is because people have a tendency to, from the movies and, and from their own early experiences growing up, they think of a robotic human collaboration as one in which you have a, you know, adorable robot like BB-8 kind of trailing after uh, Ray, trailing after the characters, and, and that's the human robotic partnership. And it will undoubtedly be like that in some of our landed missions, but the ability and machines to interface doesn't just stop there, as we all know. It is much more likely, or, or not, uh, it, much more current, and something that we expect to see in full force is that the human machine collaboration will not just be robots on another planet or robots helping on the space station, but also in the way we experience these other worlds. This is starting with, this is on site, one of the uh, AR tools that we're just starting to use on Curiosity. It's a partnership with uh, uh, Microsoft and HoloLens, and it is the, the, the clearly the way of the future, right? There are so many experiences that you could see. I think the uh, CG magazine uh, that you guys all got in your uh, registration packet has a great article about Mars 2030 and an experience that's being put together so that the data we're bringing back from the rovers and from and from, in other cases, from around the solar system, can be converted into data sets that people can experience. So there are two different uses for this, right? In our case, I actually uh, just started using this because, like in my case, I had been away for the 4th of July weekend, uh, had been on holiday, and then when I came back, Where's the rover? What are we doing? And so I put this on to get a sense of where the rover was now and what I could expect on my shift. And so it is because it's so much better than the tools that we're using. So the future is more of us experiencing these worlds through vehicles like this just for the public to, you, to envision, but also for us as planning tools. And because the reality is that we're not going to be seeing, you know, we're always going to be removed from these worlds that we visit, right? We're never going to, you know, experience them directly because we're always going to be in space suits. So we will always be somewhat removed from these worlds. And the question is just how far removed are we? And these experiences that give us the opportunity to it's it, it, to almost be there. For me, it was remarkable to have a chance to put on these, uh, to put on look around me at the terrain that we were actually going to be traversing through at the beginning of the planning day and have it be so much clearer where we were going to be. So the avatars that you see that are now, again, this is all kind of in the development stage, but these are avatars of scientists that are around the world and then they can you know they can okay shall we drill over here shall we oh, let's try to bump the rover and get over here to take images it is so it is as you as you all know it's a completely different experience when you are immersed so the journey to mars that we're beginning just about robotic exploration it's about human exploration and taking those next steps Eight days after Curiosity landed, we reached a milestone. Voyager 1 left our solar system. We are now, in some small way, an interstellar species. So the scope of what we're thinking about and what we have to explore, I mean, we are now moving out into the stars. And it's the next generation that will begin to explore exoplanets and what planets are like around us. When I was growing up, there were the only confirmed planets were the ones around our our own, uh, our own sun. And now that, that whole range is expanding to this amazing new area of astronomy that most of the graduate, many of the graduate students are going into, is exploring 
with other stars. And let's not even talk about how complicated that is technically, to try to get images and spectra of planets around, uh, around other stars. But that's a whole other topic, I digress. So the, I wanted to show you this one because I want to end by talking just a little bit about a where our fields intersect, right? It's not just about the tools and the technical, uh, the technical things that we can exchange and the capabilities that you produce that we then use. It's also about what, how we decide what we're going into. Like I said, I have wanted to work at, I worked there since I was a teenager. The inspiration to do things in science and technology is also something that comes from both of us. When this image came down, see the rover tracks? There's Curiosity. You can almost see her. We get so attached to these rovers, to these vehicles that are our extensions, that we, we'd stop, we'd, we stopped doing work when this came down. We were like, oh my goodness, there's curiosity, look at that, we can see your tracks. I mean, we just, we, this image was flashed around all over JPL and we simply stopped what we were doing. This rover is an extension of ourselves and we got an image back that showed her to us in a way that we, that is very rare, that we didn't think we'd get a chance to see her again. I think I skipped one here. So the inspiration for what we do, I mean, this is, this is a little bit real, right? We have ion engines, and so we do the, the TIE fighters where uh, that's something we are currently uh, flying is uh, ion engines. But I actually put this up to remind me to, to tell you about the fact that your, it, the industry of visual effects and, and animations, it, I can't tell you the impact that that has had on those of us who work in our field. Right? The generation that I'm in, almost all of us were inspired by Star Trek or Star Wars. Right? Many of us, you work offices and it's you know, what you would imagine seeing for the things that inspired us. And before that, it was the art of Chelsea Bonestall and the paintings that he made of what it would be like on Mars that, that motivated the generation uh, that was before me at JP. And even now, we see in movies like The Martian, which talk about all the steps that we'll need for humans to be able to live off planet, that movie has had, I get asked about it all the time. And again, although you know it does point out the dangers of, of being an astronaut, it still has inspired a whole new set. We were overrun at JPL for our open house a few weeks after this movie came out because people were so energized by that. So never underestimate your role in inspiring people to go into science, technology, and uh, in all forms of engineering. These are our travel posters that the artists at JPL, as well as it was a collaboration with, um, uh, I think it was called, um, Invisible Creature, I think was the name of the studio up in Seattle that were involved in making these posters. And these have been some of our most popular items that get downloaded because they show a vision of the future. Of course, notice everybody is in spacesuits, but that, that give us, that convey what the future could be like, whether it's robotically and, uh, and what we might see in future time. So do not forget that you have stories to tell as well, right? Our industry doesn't exist without yours, and you're going to be ahead of us. Some of the things I've seen in the VR Village and some of the papers are, uh, are amazing in what's happening here. But together, we are, we are a part of showing people all over the world what we can do when we work together. So whether you're in animation, whether you're in art, whether you're in special effects, or cutting edge on the abilities of computer graphics, this is something we share in common. I am so privileged to be a part of it, and I cannot tell you again what an honor it has been for me to be here today as one of the consumers, one of the users of what you produce. So we're in this together, and so let's go explore.
you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nagin, for um, sharing with us what you and your team do to make the Uncharted possible. <laughs> Thank you. So at this time, we have a few minutes to take a couple of questions. There are microphones in between the aisles. So if you have any questions for Nagin, I think we should be able to take one or two um, questions. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> and if not, we are pretty much like on the... Would you work at Demois? Yeah. Okay. So you'll tell me when I don't yeah, have time have for more. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to thank you so much for a wonderful uh, address oh, to you. us. On that night when your Mars rover landed, I was in the geek bar here at SIGGRAPH while well, we were in Los Angeles, and it was really memorable. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Hi, over here. I have a question about um, ways that facilitated these international disciplinary collaborations. When you got together with scientists from other countries working in different fields, how did you build a team that was able to work effectively together? Were there some team building exercises? Were there things that you did that were particularly effective to that end? Thank you. That's a great question. And uh, one of the it was last night I was just slashing at my talk because there was so much to tell. And in fact, that's one of those things that I will usually talk about as we fly from the Earth to Mars. We go through an entire series of operational readiness tests that we actually start before we leave for exactly that reason, before we launch. And that's because in order for scientists, engineers to work together, especially on a deadline. That's something you have to practice. It doesn't just happen. So we will get together and we will say, and initially we will break it down into pieces and say, for example, at the beginning of the day, when they're, they're usually about two hours for the scientists to decide what they want to do the next sol. And in order to do that, they have to, they, there are small groups that will work together, the ones that focus on the environment, the ones that focus on the geology, they'll decide what they want to do the next day. And then as a science team, they'll decide. But that is definitely not something that comes naturally at, the, at first. And so we'll put them in a room together and say, we're going to now simulate what you're going to do on Mars. You have two hours to decide. And initially, it doesn't work at all. Right, because they don't know that they don't know each other uh, completely in terms of who wants to do what, who's going to advocate for what. The leader, the the science chair, has to how to how to uh, manage that process. But eventually, we've done enough of these that they learn to work together. And now that we've landed rovers on Mars repeatedly, we the basic process is similar. Now we're learning how that changes when you have something like AR. That is, that is in the mix, and, it, and as you might expect, in some ways it speeds it up very much because people don't have to kind of enunciate with words why they think this is a good thing to do. They can show from within the data set. But we have to practice. Working together takes practice. Thank you. Let's see. Um, so uh, my name is Suyash. I am uh, right here yes. in the middle. <laughs> I, I am from San Francisco. I was at Mountain Dew at Ames, and that was really inspiring to see you know, the moment. And also today, your talk and uh, how you explained that uh, all domains in computer graphics eventually uh, are helping and inspiring people in other industries, such as space exploration. Could you talk a bit about how do you guys, what is the time lag between data that that happens in real time at, at Mars uh, or, or data comes from the rover back to Earth if the rover is going somewhere and if unfortunately it breaks down or it crashes or something. But somebody like the people on JPL or wherever, they don't realize it for I don't know how many days. Like what is that time lag and how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you handle those things? You're absolutely right that, that time lag 
defines what we do. So it is true that we will, so normally when uh, she will wake up at about 10 a.m. Mars local solar time, the Martian day is about 40 minutes longer than an Earth day. And, and uh, so she will wake up at about, again, 10 a.m. Mars local solar. She'll get her commands for that day and begin She'll look at her memory, get her commands, and start executing what she's supposed to do. Then at about 2 p.m. or uh, approximately 2 and 4 p.m. Mars local solar time, an orbiter will fly over and she'll radio her data up, right? Then she goes to sleep and then the orbiter will send the data back to JPL. So it's absolutely true that we, that, that hours have, have, uh, 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 have uh, there have been hours between when that data, when, when it happened. So if she, the rover has the ability to take care of herself, she has fault, protect, uh, fault protection algorithms that will protect her if something goes out of bounds. So for example, the uh, obvious example of that is the tilt. If she's driving along and her tilt starts to exceed a certain pre-program limit, then, then she will stop. She will say, I don't think I'm supposed to be at this tilt right, and will pause and literally wait until the ground can help her. So there's an extensive, and that was actually my first area was in fault protection. So there's an extensive set of algorithms on board, not just the rover, but any spacecraft will have these, these fault protection algorithms that will help it take care of itself until it hears from the ground. So we come in the next day and we'll say, oh, she's tilted or she didn't complete her drive, and then we will figure out what to do next. So the time lag is not usually days, uh, but it can be, it could definitely be um, a, a, a one Earth day or a, a, around that time frame. And the reason I say that is because, again, the Martian day is longer. So we are actually getting out of sync. We will eventually sync with Mars because we're no longer living on Mars time. At the beginning of the mission, we would actually rotate through the Earth day with, we would try to stay on Mars time by coming into work 40 minutes later every day. So when we do that, we stay in sync with the rover, but now we don't do that anymore so that, you know, we aren't, uh, uh, it isn't so hard on, on the people to be staying on Mars time. So when that is the case, like right now, we are in restricted sols, meaning that we are out of sync enough with Mars that we plan on Monday, uh, we'll plan on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday because we, we can't, the data won't be back in time. So the rover takes off during those time lags. So Thank that's you. That's a great Thank question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right here. Over there? Uh -huh. yes. um, looking ahead to the future a little bit, is a Europa lander the right kind of crazy? <laughs> is it your, well, so you're talking to somebody who started her career on a Jupiter mission, so I'm uh, to see what's under Europa. So the question was, is a, is, a, is a Europa lander the right kind of crazy? It's definitely in the crazy realm, but not something that we haven't been planning for. So Europa is a moon of Jupiter that has a, uh, my first mission, the Galileo mission, was the one where we first detected the possibilities Ocean. So there's a global, there's an ice crust around the entire planet, uh, uh, entire moon, below which we think is a true ocean. The first off-world, first ocean discovered since the 16th century, right? And we would like to see what's under there. He's, the gentleman is absolutely right that it is a very complicated endeavor technically. So the next mission that will go to Europa is going to be an orbiter and potentially a lander, but not one that will necessarily break through all the way to the surface, all the way to the ocean, because first we need to get some data back about how far down that is. So we're carrying a radar with the orbiter that will help us see, we need to find out how thick that ice is so that when we can then design a, uh, a spacecraft, a, a lander that will be able to land. There are pro land and go through the ice. There are prototypes that we've tested like in the Monterey Bay Aquarium and in Hawaii where there are actually things that imagine that you could have like an RTG that a, uh, a, a nuclear source that will then melt its way through the ice once we get to in, uh, below the ice then you do this transformer thing turn into a submarine and swim around. Right. That is very, seems very futuristic, and yet it's something that has been, again, tested, and we're trying to be ready for when we get the data back. So it's, it's not getting through to the surface. I mean, getting through to the ocean is something that is still further out, but it is possible that the next mission may have a lander, but not one that goes down to the surface. But I, I hope it happens soon. 
I'm, uh, I, like many people, are anxious to see, uh, to find out what that ocean's like. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? Uh, one mm, it's one more. You. Yes, we'll take one more. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, so with the seven minutes of terror video, yes. uh, you were able to create a data visualization that scared the head into thinking, no, this is crazy, you'll never be able to do this. So I'd like to, it, could you speak a little bit about how you turned that around? If, if, if the head of JPL was so opposed to the idea after watching that video, were there other visualizations that sort of swayed the balance in oh, your favor? Yeah. Or how did you, how did you reconvince that? Yeah, yes, so this is the right way to go. That, that's an excellent question. So, and actually it was JPL, uh, it was the head of NASA, since we're again one of the NASA centers. So when the idea, you're absolutely right that when the idea was pitched, it's, it, it's a, so many things have to go right that surely there's a way, right? And so then after that conversation of, try to think of something else, right? When, what happened is when you come back, there are, at that stage, at that early stage, there are multiple possible landing techniques that are being pursued. So the other teams continue to say, well, would this work if we used a pallet landing system? Is there something else that we can do that would have fewer risks? And so what ended up happening is those other chains, those other possibilities, didn't, didn't pan out as being any better or more feasible. Their, their disadvantages still ended, up being, uh, still ended up being strong. But the way you often have to convince yourself that something in planetary missions, in robotic missions might work, is you, you don't get an end-to-end -end test. Right? What, you, what you can do is test individual pieces. So you come back and you say, we think algorithms that will allow us to steer in the atmosphere. We've done more data, we've done more work, that should work. We've done some parachute tests. We think it will work with this size payload. We've done more drop tests. So you test individual pieces, you use models. And, and for example, Kepler, the planet hunter that I was on, that was something that you could never end to end. So you combine, you take a series, you combine real world tests of what you can do, like we can obviously never test in the Martian atmosphere. You take uh, models and simulations and you piece together a story that says, if every one of these things works as expected, the whole thing should work. But that's why you get you know, the level of tension you do on landing day, is because you still haven't, as much, as much as you do on the Earth, it's still not the same as how does all that work. And we focus on the interfaces because you, you test individual pieces, but what happens when you put it all together? And so what happened was we came back with, we've tried this is still the one that is also the most extensible, something we can use on future missions, and this is, with the individual pieces, it's still looking like it might work. So that's the best you can do, and in the end, you know, risk is our business. If we're going to do this, you have to take the risk. Thank you very much, enjoy the conference. Thank you, Nagin. Uh, Nagin is all actually joining us in, at the reception tonight, so those of you who are coming to the reception might be able to continue a conversation with her. But I'm to totally excited to kick off the week, enjoy yourself and experience as much as you can, and um, really enjoy your time with this amazing community. Thank you so much, and yay 2016. <laughs>